out this morning. Good to hear a bunch of good fellowship among the things of God. Good to hear the people of the Lord fellowship together. I like what the Bible said in Psalm chapter 133, verse number 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Man, what a blessing that is. Good to see you this morning. This is our first Sunday, uh, doing things a little bit different with Sunday school to give us all, including myself and all of our teachers, more time to get all of our Sunday school teaching in. All of my teachers have always come to us and said, Preacher, man, I wish we had just a little more time to finish our Sunday school lessons. I said, well, I feel the same way. I feel like I'm already, always rushed up against the clock. And so we had some folk volunteer to start doing breakfast for all of our young people. And so that's what we started this morning at 930. All the young people get a little breakfast over there from that back kitchen. And Brother John and Miss Amanda Glenn does that for the 18 and down. And so we just meet and start Sunday school at 10 o'clock. Now, I will say this to all of you guys, all of you all, and maybe just take a little poll here real fast to see how many, how many people we get to come. I've had somebody come to me and volunteer to do coffee and donuts or muffins, pastries, such as that for the adults, for you guys as well. Uh, if you would be interested in showing up to drink some coffee, fellowship, and eat a donut or two from around, you know, start around 9.15, 9.20 and run up to about men's prayer room time. If you're interested in doing that and you'd like to come be a part of that, raise your hand if you think you'd come for that. Okay, that's about everybody in here. That's a good number. So, um, so we'll, we'll plan on starting that then next Sunday for coffee and for some donuts and all that. Okay, we'll plan on that next Sunday. So if you want to be here around 9.15, 9.20, you can get a cup of coffee over in the fellowship hall, a donut, muffin, whatever it is, and we'll all mix, mingle, fellowship, tell fish stories, Brother Keith, Brother Kent, amen, and, uh, and we'll, we'll have a good time. All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians this morning. We closed our study in 1 Corinthians out about a month or so ago, and then for four weeks we dealt with <clears throat> Baptist distinctives or why we are Baptists. And it took four weeks to deal with that and did that acrostic, B-A-P-T-I-S-T-S. But this morning, we'll get back on track where I was planning on going all along, but just kind of took a little break, and that is moving on into 2 Corinthians. So we'll go back to our verse-by-verse -verse Bible teaching and outlining each chapter, giving you something out of the Word of God, and we'll embark to go through the book of 2 Corinthians this morning. Let's open in a word of prayer. And ask the Lord to help us as we start. Father, I want to say thank you this morning for these folk that have turned out to come hear the Word of God taught and preached. God, I pray that you'd speak into their souls something that would help them this morning. I realize the Word of God can help us. The Bible said the Word of God is able to build us up. God, it's able to stir us and change us. You said it's profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. God, and this morning we believe it can help us. So Lord, we come to it as the student. We come to it looking for guidance and wisdom and direction. I pray that you'd give it to us. Help us now as we embark to go through the book of 2 Corinthians. Open our understanding that we might understand the scriptures. God, we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, the book of 2 Corinthians this morning. This is the second letter, the second epistle that Paul writes to the Corinthian church, this church at Corinth. For those of you that are wondering, time difference between the first letter and the second letter, most people agree and acknowledge that this second letter was written from anywhere from a couple of months to around a year after the first one. So Paul writes the second letter directly on the heels of his first letter, which would be somewhere around A.D. 60. The first letter is written around A.D. 58, A.D. 59, and the second one is written around the year A.D. 60 this morning. Now, you remember that first epistle? The first epistle of 16 chapters of Corinthians that Paul writes, it is a, it's a running rebuke, if you will. There's, there's not a whole lot of building up, if you will, in 1 Corinthians. It's a lot of... Um, Tearing down. Somebody said you got to tear them down before you can build them up. Second Corinthians is going to have more essential elements of building this church up. 
But you always got to deal with the negative before you deal with the positive. If there's one problem with modern day preachers, it's that they only focus and harp on the positive, 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 positive to the exclusion of the negative. May I say nothing runs right without a positive and a negative. I challenge you to try and run your car strictly off of putting the battery cable on the positive pole and taking the negative one off. You won't run. I challenge you just to run it off the negative one and pull the positive one off. It won't work. Uh, man, there's a battery sitting right there. I just seen that thing's got a minus on that side and a plus on that side. That battery will not work without both. And the fact is when it comes to Bible teaching and Bible preaching, it just doesn't work if you don't have both this morning, both. And so Paul deals with a lot of negative in 1 Corinthians, a lot of negative. He deals with the chastisement of carnality in this church, a lack of spiritual discernment in using their gifts correctly. He, he chastises them for their misuse of tongues. He berates them for allowing an open fornicator who had been having relations with his father's wife to stay in the church. And so it's just over and over. Paul's having to set things straight. But we'll find in 2 Corinthians, Paul gets word back that they repented. They got right. They got their heart right. They got the church right. And now Paul's going to congratulate them and give them some positive things that can help them this morning. Now, the, the, the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul is about to open up his heart, if you will, more so than in any other book that he writes. And when I say open up his heart, he's not just going to write specifics of doctrinal things. Paul is about to open up his heart and show and tell these people that the ministry, the ministry, serving God and helping others, is not always going to be a bed of roses this morning. More so in 2 Corinthians than in any other book Paul writes. You read all of Paul's books that he writes from Romans to Hebrews. And you'll not find the detail in those books that Paul goes into in 2 Corinthians about all of his personal troubles, his personal trials, his personal afflictions, his personal problems. But here he's about to open up his heart to this church and say, Look, let me, let me tell you how tough it's been serving God. Well, let me say this to you. You're fixing to find out right off the bat in 2 Corinthians. If you think serving God, let me back up and say it like this. If you think you're going to serve God and get away with it, you got another thing coming. You're going to find out there's a real enemy called the devil that's going to try and whack you over the head. Uh, your own flesh will try and hinder you, and you live in a fallen world that is against your God and your Bible. And Paul realizes this, tries to convey it to you and I. Uh, as a matter of fact, look at all the trouble Paul talks about here just right off the bat. Look at chapter 1 and verse number, verse 8. Look at verse 8, if you will. He said, we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch we despaired even of life. Verse 9, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Uh, come to chapter 4. Come to chapter 4. I'm just going to give you a real quick overview of how Paul opens up about all this trouble that he's had. Look at chapter 4, verses number 8 and 9. Chapter 4. Verse 8, he said, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Go to the right to chapter 6. Go to chapter 6. Over and over, Paul's going to highlight all these troubles he's had. Just because he serves God. He's not an evil worker. He's not breaking the law, so to speak. He's just serving God. Uh, chapter 6, verse 4. Chapter 6 and verse 4, he said, But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. Come to chapter 7. Look at chapter 7. I mean, it just on and on. Chapter 7, verse 5. Look at verse 5 of chapter 7. He said, For when we were come into Asia, our flesh had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Without were fightings. Within were fears. And if that don't cap the whole thing off, look at chapter 11. Go to the right to chapter 11. 
Just giving you an overview here before we dive off into 2 Corinthians to let you know what we're in for. 2 Corinthians 11, and watch what he says about himself in verse 23. Chapter 11, verse 23. He said, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. He's letting them know about his credentials of apostleship. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Anybody want to join up in the ministry this morning? <laughs> I mean, the, the fact is, everything I just read to you, that ought to make everybody in the building. The fact is, you got to be either sure enough convinced that that Bible's real, Jesus is the Savior, and He really rose from the dead, and He's really coming back to get us, or you are crazy this morning. What in the world could keep a man going through all of that and not quitting? Surely going through something like that, finally he'd say, all right, I'm, I'm through with this ministry business, all that. But he just keeps right on going. Just keeps right on. Why? Because it's real. If there's one sure proof, we just come through the resurrection Sunday. If there's one sure proof that the resurrection, it was not a fake, phony story, it is the fact that 11 different men, 12, if you throw Matthias in, he was the one that they called to be a witness of the resurrection, 12 different men all suffered horrible, torturous deaths when they died, except John. They tried to kill John, but John didn't die. John's the only one out of the apostles who dies of old age. They try and kill all of them, and none of them ever in the middle and the heat of torture ever say, all right, I was just lying. We didn't really see him. It was all a fake. It was all a sham. It's all a... No. They went to their death being tortured, still holding to the fact that the Jesus that died on the cross did rise again and was the Lord of glory. If it was a fake story and a phony story, I promise you, in the heat of torture, they'd have finally give up and said, all right, we was all lying. If Paul, when he saw Jesus on Damascus Road, had it just been a made-up story in his mind, Brother John, somewhere through all this, he'd have just thrown his hands up and said, all right, I was lying, I was lying, just forget it. So here we're going to find that's the theme. You say, what's the theme of 2 Corinthians? I just showed it to you. Problems, burdens, troubles, trials, afflictions. You say, dear God, we in for a rough six months, eight months, nine months dealing with this and all. I'm going to show you where there's a God. Paul shows us that even though you got trouble, there's a God in heaven that helps you through the trouble this morning. There's a merciful God that did not say he would not allow you to go through trouble, but he said, I'll go with you through the trouble this morning. Bless his name. All right, let's dive off here. Here's our, here's our outline. If you're taking notes, here's our outline of, of chapter 1. The outline of chapter 1 will be comfort in trouble. Comfort in trouble. That's verses 3 through 10. Then Paul will show us his companions in trouble, verses 11 through 16. And then he'll show us his confidence in trouble. That's verses 17 to the end of the chapter. Comfort in trouble, companions in trouble, confidence in trouble. All right, so let's dive off here. Verse number 1 of 2 Corinthians. The first epistle that Paul writes, he uses four penmen to help him. Stephanus, Fortunatus, Achaicus, Timotheus. This one, at the end of it, he's going to tell us that he uses Luke, the beloved physician, or Lucas, and Titus. Luke and Titus are the penmen, uh, but Paul is the mouthpiece giving this letter. All right, the second epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians, chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia, Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, 
and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verses 1 and 2, that's, that's SOP, that's Standard Operating Procedure for Paul. If you read all of Paul's letters, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, uh, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 2 Thessalonians, uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews is the only outlier. And there's reasons for that that we don't have time to deal with this morning. Hebrews is the only outlier. But the other 13 epistles that Paul writes, this is the exact same way he starts them. Read them for yourself. Every one of them, he starts by giving his credentials. He either says Paul an apostle or Paul a servant of God. And then directly thereafter, either in the direct next verse or in a few verses after, he'll say, grace be to you and peace. Every one of them. It's Paul's standard lead in to a letter to anybody. Even if he's writing to an individual like Titus, Philemon, Timothy, it, it's always the same. Grace to you and peace. And I've told you this before. There's a reason why Paul always puts it in that order. He never says peace and grace. He always says grace and peace. You say, why does the Holy Ghost always lead Paul to say grace first, peace second? Because it's impossible to have peace with God and peace of God until you've made peace with God. It's impossible to know the peace of God till you have experienced the grace of God. When you experience the grace of God, then you start enjoying the peace of God. But until you experience God's grace, you don't have peace. The Bible said, there is no peace, saith my God, unto the wicked. There ain't no peace. You know, every, uh, man, some of the most wicked, ungodly people that ever lived on their tombstone, R.I.P., rest in peace. I'm sorry, they ain't resting in peace. There ain't no peace to the wicked. None. You get peace in one place. You say, preacher, I need peace for my mind. I need peace for my soul. I need peace for my heart. Where can I find peace? Right there. God's grace was demonstrated at one place. And if you want God's grace, God's peace, God's mercy, God's forgiveness, you come to one place. Right there. You get to where he, he gave grace at. And you don't get it any other way. So Paul gives his credentials. We, we talked about this in 1 Corinthians. There's no doubt he's an apostle. An apostle is someone who saw the Lord Jesus Christ bodily resurrected. Anybody who says they're an apostle today, they are not. They are a liar. It says that over in the book of Revelation. The book of the Revelation said we have tried them which say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. There are people running around today say, I'm apostle this and I'm apostle that. Brother, there ain't no apostles today. You say, why? Paul said this. Paul said, he was seen of me last as one born out of due season. You know how to become an apostle? You had to see Jesus Christ in his risen body after his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, let me pause right there. I've told you this before. But if you run up against some looney tune that says, I'm an apostle, I've seen Jesus Christ, they have either ate too much pizza before they went to bed or smoked entirely too much dope. There's something wrong. There ain't no apostles today. All this apostolic signs and wonders, it's over with. It's done. We're walking by faith in the Scripture now. Signs are for the Jews. They are not for the Gentile church. And we have highlighted all that to ad nauseum. If you want to know more about that, you go back and watch our studies in 1 Corinthians because we highlighted that so many times. It's, it's beyond belief. All right, here's the comfort in trouble. Verse 3, here we go. Verse 3, here starts our comfort in trouble. I love this verse. Verse 3, blessed be God. Even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and I, I love the next part, and the God of, not some comfort, not a little bit of comfort, he's the God of all comfort this morning. I like how Paul starts off verse 3. He uses a phrase, blessed be God. He's blessing the Lord. He's praising the Lord for something. Blessed be the Lord. Blessed be God. You realize that phrase is found only three times in the New Testament. Blessed be God is found three times in the New Testament. And it shows you that it shows you something we can bless God for in the past, something we can bless God for in the future, and something we can praise God for in the present. Can I show you the three times it's used? This is this is good. This helped me. Look at Ephesians chapter one. Paul blesses God in Ephesians chapter one for something that happened in the past. Ephesians chapter one and verse number three. Come to the right to Galatians and then Ephesians. Paul blesses God for something that happened in the past. Ephesians 1 3. Ephesians 1 3 says, Blessed be the God. There's the phrase. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. 
What's the blessing? What's he blessing him for? Verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You see what Paul blesses God for here? It's something in the past. He is praising God that way back out yonder in eternity past, God said this. God said, anybody who will put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, I have chosen them. You know how God chooses you? God did not choose anybody in here like this. Any, many, miny, mo, catch a tiger by his toe, if he holler, let him go. My mama told me to pick the very best one, and you are not it, you. Not you, you, not you. I mean, that's, that's, that's hyper-Calvinism, that it's, well, God just picked that one and then didn't pick that one and picked that one and didn't pick. No, I'll tell you how God selects. He selects based on who will have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, here's how God selects. You want to go to heaven? Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, God will choose you. You want to go to hell? Don't put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and you ain't chosen. God chose before the foundation of the world, way back out yonder in the past, that everybody that would get in Jesus Christ by faith, they can go to heaven. That sounds like a good deal to me. So Paul is blessing God for something in the past. Thank you, Lord, that way back in the past, you devised the way to save mankind from their sins. He's blessing God for something in the past. But then we find Peter blesses God for something in the future. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. We, we can not only praise God for something that happened in the past, we can praise God for something that happened or is going to happen in the future. Look at 1 Peter. Go to the right. You'll come through Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 3. It is interesting, too, that all three of these blessed be God or blessed be the God, they're all found in verse 3. 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Ephesians 1, 3. 1 Peter 1, 3. Brother, that's not by accident. I mean, I don't know what you think about that King James Bible you holding, but brother, I'm so taken with it, I even believe the chapter and verse placement are in the right spot and they're perfect. You, you can't help but believe it when you study it and look at it, man. Look what it said in 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. What's He blessing God for? This lively hope. What, what's the hope? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, verse 4. Here it is, the lively hope. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Paul praises God for something the Lord done in the past. Peter's praising God for something that's going to happen in the future. That one of these days, the blessed hope's going to come. We're going to see the glorious appearance of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're leaving out of this world to go to our reservation. But in our text, now come back to 2 Corinthians. In our text here, I told you, this is about trouble. This is about trouble. Paul ain't living in 2 Corinthians in the sweet by and by. He's living in the nasty now and now. So in this text, Paul's not praising God and blessing God for something in the past. He's not blessing God for something in the future. He's praising and blessing God for what he's got right here where he's living at. Amen. You say, what's he blessing God for in the present? Look at it, verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Verse 4, here's what he's blessing God for. Look at it, something in the present. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation. He said, I just want to take a time out and bless the name of God that in the middle of the biggest trials and tribulations I've ever been through, he ain't left me. He comforts me. He's right there with me through everything I go through. Y'all, here is, I don't hesitate to say this. I think I'm on solid ground by saying this. Here's the greatest Christian of the New Testament. The greatest Christian of the church age New Testament is the guy I'm reading behind right now. And the greatest Christian that's ever lived said he had tribulation. Now we're talking about a guy that in the middle of a jail cell can say things like, rejoice evermore. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. That's pretty, that's pretty high ground. I mean, I don't know that if I, don't know that if I got whooped and beat within an inch of my life and chunked in an old, damp, dark, nasty cell with rats running across the floor, malnourished. I'm just not sure that, you know, at midnight I could sing praises unto God like Paul and Silas did. 
I'd like to think maybe God would give me the grace to do it, but I ain't never been there to try it. I don't know. He's on pretty high ground. And here's a Christian that's living for God, serving God, walking with God. And he said, even though I'm living for God, serving God, walking with God, he's given to the work of God, he's preaching the word of God. Even a guy like that says, I got tribulations. Now let me give you an unfortunate news update. If a Christian living that much for God has tribulations, you, you and me going to have them too. Amen. See, there's this preaching going around today. You better be careful about all this prosperity preaching, all this crazy stuff, all this prosperity stuff, you know, of, of you know, if, if you'll share this, if you'll, if you'll sit, you know, it's like chain letters. They don't do chain letters anymore. Now they do them on Facebook. But, you know, if, if, you'll, if you'll share this chain letter, you'll not have any problems. Where do you get that from? You're going to end up real disappointed when you share one and you're going to get it right in the neck. Be like, God, where you at? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, all this prosperity preaching of if you'll tithe, if you'll give to missions, if you'll go to church, if you'll be faithful, man, you won't have no problems. I want to know where you ever read that in the King James Bible. Amen. You say, well, I read it over in the Old Testament. Yeah, you read some of them promises for Israel. Those are physical promises for a Jew. That if you'll serve me, I'll give you this, 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 and this. You know what the promise for the church is? You ain't promised nothing down here except God will supply all you need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We ain't getting our pie down here. Our pie's in the sky. You ain't, you're not promised anything down here but troubles and trials and tribulations. That's about all you promised down here. That's to keep us looking and longing for heaven. Say, so why would God allow me to go through troubles and trials like Paul's talking about here? Why would God allow me to go through tribulation? So you don't look and long and love this. Right. Y'all, if you never went through a trouble or a trial or a tribulation, if you didn't ever get to the place where you couldn't pay a bill, if you didn't ever get to the place where you didn't lose a loved one, if you didn't ever get to the place where you didn't have pain in your body, if you didn't ever get to the place where you didn't have discouragement or depression or betrayed or anything, why would you ever want to go to heaven? Right. You wouldn't. You'd be like, this is heaven. Let's stay here. But brother, this ain't heaven. God allows troubles and trials to come into our life so we get detached. And we set our affection on things above, not on things of the earth. And it said God comforts us in our tribulation. You say, how does he comfort us? He does it through the median of his spirit. You know what his spirit is called? You know what Jesus called the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost? Let me show you what Jesus called him. Go to John chapter 14. Look at John chapter 14. Look at what Jesus called the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Look what Jesus calls him. If you're saved this morning, you have the Holy Ghost living on the inside of you. you, you you're not waiting to get him when you fall out and talk in tongues and wall around. You got him when you enacted faith in Christ. The Bible said in Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13, in whom first ye also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and then ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. As soon as you trusted in Christ and was born again, the Spirit moved in and sealed you. He got in you by trust. Now watch what he's called. Watch what he's called. We're dealing with this trouble and comfort. Trouble and comfort. Watch what he's called. John 14, uh, 26. 14, 26. Verse 26, he said, but the, capital C, he's a person. <laughs> Not a little C, he, he's a person. He's as real as you are this morning. The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. Matter of fact, he, he says it again over here in verse 16. Back up if you would. I, I missed verse 16. This is a good one. Look at verse 16 in the same text. He said, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Don't worry about losing him once you got him. Amen. He starts abiding with you, he stays in forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him not, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. God give us his spirit. Look at chapter 16. Go to chapter 16 with me and look at verse uh, look at what the well, look at what the spirit does. It 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 um, come on down to chapter 16 and verse number 
13, chapter 16, verse 13. He said, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. See, the Holy Ghost speaks to your heart through the Scripture and through being sensitive to him what the Lord tells him to speak to you. If you ever been reading your Bible, you ever been reading your Bible, and you just, I mean, as a Christian, you say, man, the Lord spoke to me out of that verse. You know what that was? I'll tell you what that was. That was God speaking to you through His Spirit that lives in you. Man, what about that? That's awesome stuff. Said He'll show you things to come. Now watch what the Spirit does. Verse 14. He shall glorify me. You want to know a mark of a Spirit-filled child of God? Fix to tell you a mark of a Spirit-filled child of God. The mark of a Spirit-filled, Holy Ghost-led child of God is they lift Jesus up. Said the Spirit would glorify Him. If the Spirit's living inside of you, the mark of a Holy Ghost-filled child of God is they lift Jesus up. Amen. Back to our text, back to 2 Corinthians. I'll not take the time to show you, but you ought to look at how many times Paul mentions the Lord Jesus in just chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians. He's mentioned in verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 5, verse 14, verse 19, and verse 21. I mean, brother, he mentioned in one guy in one chapter about nine or ten different times. Why is that? Paul's filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. He's just talking about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. All right, here, look what he says. You say, why would God allow me to go through tribulation? Not only so you get close to him and he comforts you, but there's more to it. Look at verse 4. We're still in verse 4 here. Who comforted us in all our tribulation? Here it is. Watch. That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. You know why God allows you to go through trouble? A lot of times it ain't even for you. God allows you to go through trouble sometimes just so he can comfort you, help you, and then you can turn around and comfort somebody else going through the same thing you've gone through with the same comfort of God that you've experienced. Now you can turn around and give it to somebody else. You know what we're called to be? We are called, there's an old song talked about channels only. Funnels. That's what we're called to be. We're just a funnel. We are, not, we are not called to be a bowl that just holds God's stuff and not let it out. We're called to be a funnel. God pours things through us to somebody else. I've often been told, and I believe this, that God will give things through you that many times He will not give to you. I can't tell, I, I can't tell you the times that I've had somebody, literally, I can't tell you how many times this has happened to me. I can't tell you the time, and this is just a crude illustration, how many times I've had somebody walk up to me at a meeting or in a church or something like that and hand me, a, hand me some money. Say, preacher, I don't know why God told me to give this to you, but God told me to give this to you. Say, man, I appreciate that. God bless you. And I mean not 10, 15 minutes later, they'd take an offering up and say, these people over here got a real need, and I didn't have a dab of cash on me until then. And they'd say, these people right here need some help. Let's take an offering up for them. The Holy Ghost said, give them what I just gave you. Amen. All right. See God, God didn't, see, God really wasn't giving that to me. He was giving it through me. He was just trying to get it from hand to hand to go where it really needed to go. And it's the same thing with comfort. Um, and it's, you know what I'm doing to you this morning? I'm trying to comfort you with the Scriptures. I'm giving you comfort from the Scriptures. You know where I learned this comfort from the Scriptures? From other people teaching it to me. Right. It really wasn't for me, even though it's helped me. You know who it's for? It's so I can give it to somebody else, help somebody else with it. You know why we have a Joshua circle? Yes. Amen. You know why we have a Joshua circle? Because somebody went through some gut-wrenching, heart-breaking tribulation and trouble, Amen. but they didn't let it make them bitter. They let it make them better, and then they just turn around and start helping other people that's going through the same stuff. Amen. That's what, what Joshua said. Verse 4, I don't know if Joshua Circle got a theme verse. If it don't, that should be it. That's what it is. We're, they're just comforting others with the comfort they got of God. Amen. And it helps people. That's what, that's what the Christian life is about. Helping somebody else with the comfort God helps you with. You say, I thought it was about seeing sinners saved. Ain't that part of the comfort? 
you were a lost sinner going to hell and God saved you. So now what your job is? Turn around and help somebody else come to that same saving knowledge of Jesus Christ that God helped you with. Amen. Or you went through some trouble and was hurt and God brought you through it. Now you turn around and help somebody else. I'll tell you what I love to read. Your level of being able to help somebody is directly proportionate with how deep a valley you've been through. Right. Amen. It is. You can't really help somebody go through anything till you've been through something yourself. You can't. You can't. You can't really help somebody in a trouble or a trial that their hearts broke until you've had your heart broke. Now, I don't like having my heart broke. But I realize it's the only way, one, to experience God's real comfort in my soul, and two, it's the only way to really help somebody else. I'll tell you what I like to read. I'll tell you what a lot of people like to read because they're bestsellers all the time. Which, by the way, them books you give me, Miss Reader, are awesome. Thank you. I, I'm, I'll talk to you about that later on. Can't wait to read some of them. Anyways, um, yeah, I'll give a few of them to this young preacher up here. He's going to read a few of them too. Good stuff. Thank you. Um, I like to read books about people that went through something and come out the other side victorious. I love to read that stuff. That's why I like military history. Great personal tragedy and sacrifice, and the person either comes out on the other side, you know, alive, or even if they passed away, they went through something and they didn't quit. That is inspiring to me. It is absolutely inspiring to me. What does that do for me? Helps me want to go on. I'll tell you something everybody needs to listen to. All y'all got YouTube. I'm going to tell you something you need to YouTube search and listen to it. It is the testimony of a woman named Darlene Rose. Her maiden name was Dibler. Uh, her second husband's name was Rose. Her name is Darlene Dibler Rose. Darlene Rose. You need to, you need to YouTube that and, and listen to that testimony. Her testimony, I'll never forget the first time I listened to that thing. It's about an hour or so long. It'll be the best hour you spend this week, I promise you that. The first time I listened to that thing, I was preaching a youth rally up in Delaware, uh, Smyrna, Delaware, and I listened to it one morning before service. And brother, that thing, that thing helped me so much and convicted me so much, I literally got off the side of the bed, laid on my face on the floor, and bawled my eyeballs out and apologized to the Lord for being such a wimpy, sorry servant. This woman put me to shame. This woman and her husband went to Papua New, I believe it was Papua New Guinea, right about the time World War II started. Went over there to them aborigines. She said the first time she ever walked into a village, they'd never seen a white woman before. They come running up the hill to her, and they started touching her skin, trying to wipe the white off. They'd never seen a white person. They tried to wipe it off, and she becomes so beloved by them, her and her husband started leading them to God. These people had never seen a white person, never heard about Jesus. They start leading them to God. They wasn't there, it was, I think, less than a year. World War II broke out, and the Japanese took over that island. Now, if you've read anything about World War II, the Japanese were some of the most ruthless, um, hateful individuals during the war that you'll ever read about. I mean, brother, it's like ISIS, except with military backing behind them. Torture, just is crazy. Anyways, they come in that village and separated her and her husband. The last thing she saw of her husband, never saw him again alive on the face of the planet. She's only in her 20s. She's just a young girl. Left America, went over there and started serving God. The Japanese come in, separate her and her husband. Last thing she saw of her husband, she run back in the place where they stayed. And she got his Bible. And she run back to the Bible. And on the truck, they were hauling him away. And she run up and she put that Bible in his head. And he looked at her. The last thing he ever said to her is he said, Darlene... God will never leave you nor forsake you. Wow. Last thing he ever said to that woman, he died in a prison camp. They never saw each other again. Wow. Never saw him. That woman lived in concentration camps. The Japanese thought she was a spy, and she wasn't. That woman suffered tortures and beatings. I'll tell you what broke me, Brother Ivy, what broke me is she was testifying about being in a jail cell. And every day the Japanese would come and interrogate her, beat her and interrogate her. And she wasn't a spy, she was just a Christian. And, uh, and they wouldn't feed her hardly nothing. And she said she looked out the cell one day and she saw, I think she saw either a monkey, it was either a monkey or one of the guards eating a banana. I can't remember which, it was something eating a banana. And she saw that banana and she said, Lord, I'd give anything for a banana. I know I don't deserve it, Lord, 
But I'd give anything just to have a fresh banana. I'm so hungry. She said it wasn't long after that they come got her. Brother Matthew, they took her off to interrogation and all the stuff that went along with that and mental and physical abuse. She said, when they brought me back to my cell, I have no idea why the guard didn't confiscate it. And I have no idea who put it there. She said, but when I come back to my cell, there was a whole bushel of bananas in my cell. She said, a whole bushel of bananas in my cell. She said, and I was this close from jumping on them and just, da- just gobbling them up. She said, but I felt, I felt so thankful and unworthy that God would let me have anything. She said that before I even ate one, I got on my knees and I said, Lord, thank you for giving me these bananas to eat. You say, that don't mean nothing. It does if you live in where she's at, man. And story after story of that stuff right there, man. You want to listen to that testimony? That helped me so much. I've listened to it two or three times. Now, anytime I start feeling sorry for myself, I listen to Darlene Rose. I feel a whole lot better about where I'm at after I listen to where she's been at. You say, what is that? That's her comforting somebody else with the comfort she got of God. That's what the thing's about, man. Turn around and help somebody else. All right, verse 5, and we'll shut it down here. He said, uh, we're to help those in any trouble by the comfort, whether we ourselves are comforted of God. Verse 5, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. So what's he saying there? He's saying he suffered in some of the same ways Jesus did. As the sufferings of Christ abound in us. Paul suffered some like the Lord. Now he didn't suffer like carrying the sin of the world. That's not what I'm talking about. But Paul knew what it was like to be mocked, lied to, whipped, beaten, imprisoned, forsaken, betrayed. Paul knew what it was like. But Paul says this, because, watch verse 5. He said, as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, the next part so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. He's saying this. He says, because I've been a partaker of the sufferings of Christ and I've been through some things, now that Christ that went through that before me, he's my great high priest, Hebrews chapter 4, and he's touched with the feeling of my infirmity. And the same Christ that now I follow into suffering, he now gives me his consolation because he's been there too. You sit here this morning and you say, Preacher, don't nobody know what I'm going through. Don't nobody know where I'm at. You're wrong. You're wrong. There's a Savior in heaven that's been there before you. And the Bible said we can cast all our care on him because he cares for us. You know the only way to understand that consolation of Christ? You have to deal with the sufferings. (laughs) No suffering, no consolation. It's the only way to really experience it. I don't like the suffering, but I'll tell you what I do like. I do like that consolation. And so if the only way I'm going to be able to fellowship and understand his consolation is to have the sufferings, then Lord, I guess sign me up. So that way I can know you a little bit better. The comfort uh, here in the text, comfort in trouble. We've still got several more verses that Paul shows us about this comfort in trouble. Let's pray. Father, I pray you'd take the first installment of our... Sunday school time, uh, dealing with this trouble and dealing with 2 Corinthians. And Lord, may it help you people. This morning, God, I pray that you would help them, uh, those that have been through trouble or going through trouble. Help them, Lord, to seek out and search for somebody to be a comfort to because they're going through something themselves. God, we'll thank you for it now. Bless the 11 o'clock hour. Move among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you're dismissed right there for 11 o'clock.